Hello and welcome to this message on eschatology, the end times. What do you believe? Is it in the Bible? Uh, this message, we're going to take a look at a historical and biblical view of the topics. Uh, do you know how many times the rapture has been predicted to occur? Have you heard about a seven-year tribulation? Do you believe a red heifer must be sacrificed and a third temple built in order for Jesus to return? Do you believe there is a secret rapture and then Jesus will come again with his saints, that there are two comings? Is what you believe in the Bible, and do you know the historical connection to what you believe? Are the pastors preaching the word or commentaries? Who and what do you believe? Before we get started, I'm going to say a prayer of blessing over this. Uh, Father God, I just ask you to help me. Help me to deliver the word that you gave me for such a time as this. Lord, I pray that you would open the ears of everyone who hears this message and that you, Father, will speak through my lips um, today. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to give a disclosure that um, what I'm about to present to you, I just recently learned on my own. I grew up uh, believing that you know, I could, I may be raptured at any time um, that, you know, I grew up as a child scared uh, that the rapture had taken place and I had missed it. And I would have night terrors because of it. I would wake up screaming. I would look for people to see if they were here. Uh, it was fear. I was put into fear so much when I was a child um, that, you know, I was a bad person, that even though I had accepted Christ as my Savior and believed upon him, confessed my sins, and was trying to uh, change my life that I still had this um, possibility that, you know, I could, I, that was my focus. My focus wasn't on Jesus. My focus was the rapture. So I, I um, just recently, you know, the Lord has opened up things to me, and there's maybe some things in this presentation that you don't agree with. I'm sure there are, and that's okay. Uh, we are all at a different walk. We need to all ask the Lord to provide understanding um, for these times in which we live. And um, I'm not here to change your mind. I'm just here to present information. Uh, our job is to plant seeds and water, and the Holy Spirit will open up our eyes. And I encourage you to question everything, research, do your own research, and look at everything um, that you've that you see here. I do have the notes available with the references on the slides if you'd like to see where I got a lot of my information. I try not to ever put my opinion in, but to have something to support it and back it. So, um, you know, Jesus is coming. I do believe that. I believe he's coming physically. He's coming back to earth. Um, when we say Jesus is coming, uh, that means a lot of different things for different people. Um, no one has all the answers. We are told, though, that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge um, and that we have to search the scriptures daily to see if the things that we're being told, no matter who tells us, to see if it's so. Uh, and we that's why we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to teach us all things. He is our teacher. He is um, the one who guides us um, through the inspired word of God to open our eyes to what we should believe. Uh, you can take a look on Wikipedia or do a Google and find out how many times the rapture has been predicted. Now there's 58 uh, times listed on Wikipedia currently, but there's there's been many, many more times. These are just famous people uh, that have predicted the rapture yeah, and that's gotten you know worldwide attention. <clears throat> but there's been many, many times, or some even this week, some during the eclipse, you know, where there's been more predictions that uh, the rapture would happen. You know, I've heard people say, I'm not setting a date. I'm just saying, be ready, you know, but it's still, it's planting a seed of fear of that, you know, um, in, in many cases. Um, and, and I just want you to take a look at this list. You know, you can see that the last one on the list is Isaac Newton. Most of these people, a lot of these people on this list are not even Christians. Uh, that's predicting that rapture. He predicted it based on mathematical calculations. But it's interesting that people can continue to prophesy and say this is the time it's, it's going to happen, but yet 
um, sell books on it, uh, movies or whatever. And then um, when it doesn't happen, they're still popular. Uh, they can. It seems like that you know, prophecy clock can take licking and keep on ticking. Um, but you know, where do all these teachings come from? The seven-year tribulation, the reinstating of Israel as a nation, the red heifer. Um, the third temple, the rapture, and then the second coming, uh, two, two comings, um, and, and a one-man antichrist. Now, the word says that he's coming back in the same manner that he went up. It said, in the same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. See, the Bible focuses on um, the coming of the Lord instead of the going of the church. And, and that's what that's what we don't hear a lot of. He came in the flesh and, and then his spirit was left here on, on the day of Pentecost or in Pentecost uh, for us to guide us. And he's here now in the spirit and he will return again in the flesh. He didn't come two times. Uh, and, and so I don't uh, in the beginning. So I don't think he's going to come two times in the end uh, when he shall come. Um, he will be glorified in his saints is what the word says. Uh, and to be admired in in all them that believe. So we're going to talk about the two differences. <clears throat> we, you've probably heard about replacement theology, where people say that the church has replaced the Jews. Well, what you're going to find out is that eschatology, the doctrine of last days, has really been replaced the doctrine of Jesus Christ to get our focus on all of these things in the end, the death, the end of the world, uh, the second coming, the last judgment, rather than Jesus Christ, the work and the person of Jesus Christ and how he works in and through us as his church. Now, this is spread through dispensationalism. Uh, I remember as a child having big charts in my church um, from dispensationalism that was dispensational charts. And these charts are a theological framework. They are also in many Bibles. I wouldn't buy a Bible unless it had a chart in it when I was um, uh, younger. And so it says that God acts uh, with his chosen people in different ways at different times. You know, that things change based on where we are in history. They believe that there is a distinction between Israel and the church, that they're two totally separate uh, rules and methodologies uh, and theologies for like the church's the spiritual ch stepchild, you know, that we are totally separate. Uh, and this is part, uh, this is the belief of premillennialism and Zionism and that the rapture of the church, the church has to get out of here uh, before the tribulation and then the second coming of Christ will come. That's the pre-trib period. And I've had people say, well, are you talking about the, the rapture or the second coming? You know, that, that that's two different things. Uh, so dispensationalism is eschatology and it's different from covenant theology, which is a focus on Jesus Christ. These are two competing frameworks. Dispensationalist doctrine hinges on the fact that Israel is a separate entity from the church and that they are separate. And that's just simply not taught in the Bible. Uh, it says if the foundation is shaky, the whole building's going to fall. And a lot of people's faith is going to fall when things don't match up with their chart, when things don't match up on, way, on the way they've been taught that they're going to happen. When that doesn't happen, who, has, who have we put our faith in? Have we put our faith in the person that told us this? Or have we put our faith in because we've actually read it in the Word and, um, and let the Holy Spirit guide us and teach us? So there's this dispensationalist doctrine stretches Daniel's 70th week. See, there's 70 weeks in Daniel, and 69 of them, they say, happened in the biblical times. But the 70th week, they say, is stretched all the way to the future and hasn't happened yet. And that it teaches that the Jews and the modern Israel state uh, are the favorite chosen people of God. That's enough teaching. And that the modern statehood of Israel, uh, beginning in 1948, that's when the countdown starts to the end. Uh, they say that's the countdown to the 70th week. Uh, so there's there's like a chart here showing those two comings, those future comings, the secret rapture taking people out prior to the Great Tribulation, and then the, the second coming, and then the millennial reign. The, the covenant theology with the focus on Jesus Christ, um, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord, 
um, denies that there's any connection between the ethnic Israelites, those who are Israelites, and the current land that's now called Israel, that's been named Israel to confuse people, because what's been named Israel was never Israel in the Bible. The entitlement of any one ethnic or religious group to territory in the Middle East called, quote, the Holy Land cannot be supported by scripture. So let's take a look at who is Jesus. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. A the Abrahamic covenant gave that land and the whole earth to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the seed of David. The Davidic covenant gave Jesus Christ the throne, meaning that he, he is heir to the land, the whole earth, and he's the one that's heir to the throne. And we who are believers in Jesus Christ are the church. We are joint heirs with him. So we, ha we have the same rights as him through Jesus Christ. Now let's take a look at the history of the thousand years, the millennial beliefs. Our forefathers, the, the apostles in the Bible, the, the first three centuries with the apostles, uh, you know, they taught and believed, and a lot of Christians still believe, and I do, that Jesus will physically return to the earth uh, before the millennium, which is a thousand years of peace. Now, the Catholic Church came out with something called the amillennium, which is there'll be no millennial reign. That it's a current reign, um, uh, that Christ currently reigns in heaven with the saints. And then there's a new group called the Social Gospel, or this new group that's come out in the 19th and 20th centuries, that says that the post-millennial reign is what will happen, that we will see Christ coming uh, and occurring after the millennium, and that everybody will become, pretty, pretty much everybody will become a Christian uh, during that time. So there's some conflicts on that. So let's take take a look at dispensationalism and Christian Zionism. One thing I noticed on my three trips to Israel was the uh, American flag flying beside the, the uh, Jewish flag pretty much everywhere you looked. So what is Christian Zionism? It's an advoc it advocates the return of the Jewish people to the Holy Land. And it says that the founding of the state of Israel in 1948 was in accordance with biblical prophecies in the Old Testament. It says that the reestablishment of the Jews, the gathering of Israel, is a prerequisite for the second coming of Jesus Christ. That, that had to happen before Jesus could come. Uh, actually, this term, Christian Zionism, replaced the term Christian Restorationism, which means that that was a, a group trying to restore the church to a biblical form. So it replaced that. Now, this is an article from the Institute of Jerusalem Studies that, that supports that, that the Jews had to go back to that Holy Land in order for the second coming of Jesus to happen. They say in the Institute of Jerusalem Studies, in this article, that this, well, this was never a fundamental component, component in evangelical thinking, that it was an outside movement which grew among some evangelicals during the 18th and 19th centuries, primarily John Darby and Cyrus Schofield, and that the publication of the Schofield Bible included the commentary, which is what most people read because they don't read the Bible, they read the commentary, and the pastors preach from commentaries, and that reflects the teachings of Christian Zionism, and that's what contributed to this popularity among Christians, including evangelicals. Now, again, reading, this is directly from the article. I have the link there that you can get the article. It says that this movement had distinct teachings concerning the end of the world, such as the war of Gog and Magog, and it taught that certain prophecies will be fulfilled during the end times before the second coming of Jesus, and it taught that there will be an end gathering of Jews from all around the world to Palestine at the end of days where most of them will be killed, and then uh, that's the 144,000 Jews. Uh, and that the second coming of Christ takes place, ushering in the golden age, referred to as the millennium or the thousand-year reign. I want you to look at these two places I have red asterisks. It says both the Old Testament and the New Testament were woven into an end-of-the-world drama. Now, this is in their, their article, uh, uh, end-of-the-world drama, 
Over the years, different rulers and regimes were labeled Antichrist and were woven into these different and ever-changing narratives. And most of these ideas found little currency among Christians until the creation of Israel in 1948. That's what grabbed hold into the Christian uh, evangelical world. Until then, it was viewed, that, that time, 1948, was viewed as heralding the start of the end of the world drama prophesied in the Bible. And it says here, you can read the rest of that. I'm not going to read every one of them, every sentence, but it says the Middle East events created a great opportunity for the secular Zionists. Now, there's 11 different Zionist types, and they're all related to the Jews and returning the Jews uh, with a method like a world Zionism, a social Zionism, a secular Zionism, a Christian Zionism. They all have different focuses to make all this come together and make it happen. This is in their own Institute of Jerusalem Studies. That, you know, this was an opportunity for the secular Zionist movement to take advantage of this particular Christian interest to garner support for its political program did this by advancing a number of ideas, such as the idea that it is a Christian's duty to support the state of Israel, which God himself was supporting, and that, that such support would result in speeding up the second coming of, Christ, of Jesus, which true believers, they were eager to see that happen. Now look at my other asterisk here, biblical verses taken out of context and applied to the modern state of Israel were standard features of this approach. For example, the Bible is quoted as teaching that God blesses those who bless thee, they changed it to Israel when it was Abraham, and curses those who curse thee, Israel, when they, they changed it from that, which it was Abraham, and that he who touches you, Israel, touches the apple of God's eyes. Also put forward was the assertion that God's promises to Abraham apply to this current secular state of Israel. So, uh, there's a lot there. And, uh, you know, we're going to start here with Martin Luther, uh, the Reformation, and John Calvin. They didn't mention any such uh, theology. Any such eschatological views that said that the Jews have to return to Palestine in order for Jesus to come back. Rather, Luther had hoped that the Jews would convert to his brand of Christianity once he broke off with the Catholic Church. So Luther and Calvin saw the Catholic Church as being a spirit, the spiritual Israel. And they viewed that since the time of Jesus Christ, the covenant with God was with faithful Christians. Read that in Hebrews about the, the wall of faithful people, uh, that Abraham was faithful. You know, Rahab was faithful. Noah was faithful. It's the faithful Christians who are the exclusive people of God. There's no special privilege between me or the, the people in the state of Israel. They have nothing over me. I have nothing over them. There, the word says clearly in Acts 17, there's one blood, one nation on this earth, and there's no respecter of persons. It's our faith in Jesus Christ that, that puts us into the spiritual Israel. Now, I purchased and have in my possession these books, this encyclopedia, the Jewish encyclopedia from 1972 which was after the 48th state of Israel was formed. And it says that from the time of the Reformation, the belief that the Jews would return to the Holy Land in accordance with the biblical prophecies became popular. It says that this view was strong in the U.S. from the 18th century and that the Protestants were flooded with publications and sometimes the heads of state were requested to take political measures by non-Christians in order to obtain, obtain rights for the Jews to settle in the Holy Land. In 1830, the Plymouth Brethren Church, founded by John Darby, separated from the Church of England, uh, this, he, he was a, the leader of the dispensationalist movement, asserted that all the biblical prophecies 
relate to the return of the Jewish people to its homeland prior to the second coming. So that he was propagating through his, uh, through his doctrine that the Jews would have to return in order for these biblical prophecies to come to pass. <clears throat> and many Protestant fundamentalist churches adopted this outlook and continue to promote it to this day. Now, this is what the Jewish Encyclopedia said. So, you know, Martin Luther, he was this German priest, the theologian, and he came against the Pope, and he wrote a 95 thesis document uh, sparking the Protestant Reformation to separate from the Catholic Church and to form the Protestant movement. That happened in 1517. And what's interesting is, is that 200 years later is when modern Freemasonry started to the date. Freemasons, 1717, 200 years. 200 years after that, 1917, was when the Balfour Declaration uh, was written to bring the Jews back to um, the Holy Land. Meanwhile, we have Francisco Ribera, who is another very important person. He was a Jesuit. I'm going to tell you what a Jesuit is here in a minute. Uh, they have one of the most awful oaths that they take. It's even worse than the Freemasonry oath. Uh, but he, he was going to get the heat off of the Pope. So in order to do that, he wrote, you know, this documentation, and he placed that Daniel 70th week out into the future. He stretched, put a rubber band on it, stretched it all the way to the future, that the 69 weeks had happened during Daniel or the biblical time, and now the 70th week hasn't happened yet. So we're waiting for it to happen out into the future, he says, and that would get the heat off Antichrist because he said the Antichrist is a single future individual because Luther and others were calling the Pope the Antichrist, including King James. Um, and so he countered, Ribera countered the Protestant Reformation to get the heat off the Pope, and that became, uh, as the Pope is the Antichrist, that became the Counter-Reformation, which it, it, they say it ended in 1648, but it's still going on as of today. That Counter-Reformation is still going on. So the Jesuits, this, these are some pictures I took over in Rome. The Jesuit logo is on so many buildings you wouldn't believe uh, throughout Rome. It is a secret society within the Catholic Church, and it was organized by the crypto Jews. And the crypto Jews are those people who, Jews who were Jews in their heart, but Catholics in the public. Uh, See, so the Catholics um, forced them when they were, came to Rome to become Catholics, and they really weren't Catholics. They were still Jews in their heart. So there is a lot of uh, bitterness and things going on here with the heart versus the public. But this logo uh, is still on many, many buildings and uniforms and throughout Rome. Uh, e even today, I just took this picture a few months ago. And so you can find all kinds of books on the Jesuits and it's tied to the New World Order. Um, that's The purpose is to bring down America and Christianity. And now we have uh, the first uh, Jesuit Pope, Pope Francis is the first Jesuit Pope to be in the papacy. This group actually founded the feast day for Lucifer back in 15, uh, as 1534. They're said to have killed Abraham Lincoln and other presidents. Um, the head of the Freemasons, they are is said to have to be a Jesuit. And so um, I, I've listened to Martin Malachi, uh, um, uh, Malachi Martin, um, for many years, um, since the 80s, you know, he's a former Jesuit, Catholic, uh, former Jesuit leader that spoke out against it. You know, okay, and there's there are many Jesuits who have come out against it now that they've seen the, the light. But it is still a very thriving force. Um, Brian, uh, Brandon Howes of Lindell TV said recently uh, that, you know, that Joe Biden is connected to this, uh, that he's a Jesuit ally of Pope Francis to bring down America. Uh, sure, it's looking like it. Um, dividing the world into different regions. Um, and, you know, that these, they, they, there are Catholic leaders, Archbishop Viagro, uh, he's spoken out against it very much so, and also against the Freemasons, the infiltration of the Freemasons and the Jesuits into this global church to infiltrate the political system, the social system, all those Zionist things that I just told you, there's 11 different um, Zionist movements are infiltrated. Uh, and that social justice, uh, a part of Marxism is coined by a Jesuit 
priest. And so that, that was a good report that he has. You can view that probably on YouTube. Um, Francisco Ribeira is uh, back to him. He's that Jesuit theologian that stretched Daniel all the way out. Uh, there's four, um, four kingdoms in the vision in Daniel 2 and talks about the four different beasts in Daniel 7. And he made it into five and stretched uh, that 70th week all the way out um, to the future. So future, futurism means it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and so they connect um, the 70 weeks to Matthew 24 about the abomination of desolation spoken of by the Daniel, uh, Daniel prophet. And when Jesus was talking, when the disciples were saying, you know, how, how will we know that this is the end of the age? And, and Jesus is talking about what Daniel was talking about. And I'm going to do a whole um, uh, Zoom call on just this topic, uh, the abolition, um, the cause of sacrifice and abolition to cease. That's going to be my next Zoom on how this is not uh, related to the Antichrist at all. This is about Jesus Christ. And so, um, you know, it does boil down to that. If we stand for Jesus Christ, that's what they really hate. That's what that's what is really hated. Um, so our focus needs to get back on how to um, how to be strengthened uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit to stand in this day that that's upon us. Um, so. But there is no seven year tribulation in the Bible. There's the people that talk about a seven year tribulation. The, the, the verse that they go back to is Daniel 9, but this is not about a seven-year tribulation, and that's what I'm going to show you in the next Zoom call, where it talks about confirming the covenant for many with one week, and so um, that will be in June, and so this is the only reference they have. If you take this reference away from them, they don't have any other place. There's a three-and-a-half-year tribulation, but there's no seven-year tribulation, but before Ribera, the focus was on Jesus, not on all these events. Um, at that time, the Protestants, they interpreted this Daniel 9 in the 70th week to have been fulfilled by Jesus Christ uh, from 27 A.D. to 34 A.D. That was the, the seven years. And so they have stretched this out to a future thing that they're saying has yet to happen with an Antichrist. Again, replacing it, uh, Antichrist replacing what Jesus Christ did for us. So it's very deceiving uh, because of all of these propagated as you saw right there in the Jewish studies, uh, that that was the tactic, the propaganda put out uh, that, that's in many commentaries that's been put out into the seminaries, into the churches. The Apostles' Creed focused on Jesus, that he's going to come again. He was visible, personal, and glorious. He's coming uh, as our blessed hope, our glorious great God and our Savior. It wasn't, it's, it's about him coming, not about our going. If you'll notice that. Uh, so Ribera, this first Jesuit priest, why is he doing this? Again, to get the heat off the Pope. Uh, you know, they were saying Nimrod. Of course, we've heard Nimrod, Nero, Hitler, Stalin, Gorbachev, Hussein, King Charles, um, uh, Obama. All different kinds of people have been uh, the Antichrist. And of course, the Antichrist spirit is working through so many people. Uh, but the Roman Catholic Church is the mother of harlots. And all the Protestant churches are the daughters and the granddaughters of the harlot because they're, they haven't separated from the paganism. We still have churches that can't separate Easter from Passover. So they have continued to keep all of these teachings in the church uh, with the infiltration of Freemasons where there may not be Jesuits in the Protestant church, but there's def definitely Freemasons who's doing the work of the, of the Jesuits. Uh, not even knowing it, maybe. Uh, but in 1585, um, Ribera wrote a commentary about the apocalypse and the pre-trib, and he stated that the this Antichrist, this single individual, uh, not a spirit, he said, will persecute and blaspheme the saints of God, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, abolish the Christian re religion, deny Jesus Christ, destroy Rome, be received by the Jews, pretend to be God, kill the two witnesses of God, and conquer the world. So that was in his uh, commentary, commentary back in 1585. Um, so then we have this Jesuit cardinal to come out in uh, 1586, and he continues what Ribera started, and he continues to support what he started and uh, encounter uh, 
countering the Reformation to get the heat off the Pope. And he was saying, he wrote this uh, paper uh, disputing, you know, that the Pope is not the temporal ruler of the world. Uh, the temporal rulers don't derive their authority to rule from God, but from the consent of the governed. And so he's saying, you know, that, you know, getting the heat off the Pope, the Pope is not the Antichrist. Um, so shortly thereafter, King James uh, over in England, uh, he and the Pope uh, were have some, having some serious um, disputes and they hated each other. OK, and he, because King James declared Rome as the seat of the Antichrist and that the Pope was the Antichrist. And even the, the Jesuits at that time unsuccessful, unsuccessfully attempted to assassinate King James in 1605. And thankfully they didn't because he did have uh, 54 writers, uh, scribes, to translate what uh, Wycliffe and Tyndall had started into the English translation, the authorized version of the 1611 King James Bible. And as a result, you know, many Catholics were converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which that really uh, set things on fire. So, um, uh, yeah, do I believe every every uh, word has been translated uh, exactly? Well, there's a lot of books out there you can figure out. For example, the word Easter is in the King James Bible, but it, it's, it should have been Passover from the Geneva Bible. So there are a few things, but it is the inspired word of God. Whenever you read the word, it was, it's the inspired word of God. And that's been the whole struggle because the Catholic church would not allow their people to read the Bible. And so we do have the Bible today because of King James. Uh, yes, uh, he was a Freemason. Anyone that is in authority is automatically um, an honorary Freemason. Now, Freemasonry did not start until 1717 as we know it today with the infiltration of the Jesuits. So the Jesuits had not infiltrated that time uh, when he was uh, a Freemason. Again, uh, most all presidents are honorary, honorary Freemasons. Most all political leaders are controlled by uh, the Jesuits or the Freemasons. Um, so uh, also around this time, 1620, what's going on? You know, this is, the Bible's been written. So 1620, here come the pilgrims into Massachusetts to sign the Mayflower Compa Compact, that they want to live in accordance with the Christian faith uh, in an American democracy. And that's what laid that foundation for America. But, you know, the, the you don't hear very much about the Mayflower Compact. You don't hear that uh, you, when you go up to Massachusetts, they have it on a back wall. Uh, it's not even prominent. But that's that's how this started, you know, that that was the reason why they came here. They were known as separatists. They wanted to separate separate from the Church of England, which had become a combination now of Catholic teaching and Re Reformation teaching. And so after they were here and got established, the, the term Christology became uh, a term in the dictionary in 1654. Uh, the, and that was teaching the doctrine of Christ throughout our country. Uh, and this is our foundation right here, not the Declaration of Independence. This is uh, not that the Declaration of Independence is not a, a powerful document that gives us our rights, but this is our spiritual uh, foundation. And so, meanwhile, 1666, here comes a guy named Shabbatos Zevi, a Jewish mystic, and he declares he's the Messiah. And what a, what a um, year to do that. 1666. And he even signed his letters, I am the Lord your God, Shabbatos uh, Zevi. And he began to proclaim redemption to all the Jews. And uh, he had over 1 million passionate Jewish believers, about half of the world's population at that time, following him. And he said the way through, the way to be redeemed is through sacred sin. And that he encouraged and practiced sexual promiscuity, adultery, incest, and religious orgies. So now we are opening up the door to mysticism. Um, it's being opened up wider. Not that it wasn't there, but it's being opened up wider. And you have half of the Jewish population um, believing this lie. So while that's going on, we have Sir Isaac Newton. The, phys the physicist and the mathematician and the mystic. He was very involved with the occult, uh, with the same um, documents, the same the same Bibles, the Kabbalah that this 
a fake messiah had. Um, they, fa they called Isaac Newton a messianic mystic. And so this Kabbalah is the same doctrine, uh, theology that uh, Zevi was teaching to all of these Jews about um, a sacred sin to redemption. And so, um, believe it or not, Sir Isaac Newton had this, com uh, this, this compulsion to write about the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the Third Temple. In 1704. So here he is writing about this. And at the end of the world, he's doing mathematical calculations to calculate when the end of the world is. And remember, he's on that list of rapture people. Uh, he says that 2060 is the end of the world. That's what he uh, calculated back in 1704. And he was calculating the uh, the end of days, uh, countdown of doom. He he had a passion for alchemy. He was in the occult, uh, in the into Christian mysticism, enlightenment. You may think of it as a New Age movement. But many of his writings, his interpretation of the Bible, the tabernacle, the temple, his calculations of the end times, his historical documents, and and how he derived this through mysticism and occultism and alchemy. All of those manuscripts are located in the National Library of Israel, and that's where his manuscripts are honored, studied today. So Zevi dies, and this guy, Jacob Frank, comes along, and he's a religious leader, and he claims to be the reincarnation of Zevi. And he, like Zevi, pushed it to another level with the strange acts and uh, ritual sacrifices now with the orgies and, and sexual immorality. He slept with his followers and even his own daughter when he's preaching this doctrine. The best way to imitate God is to cross every boundary, transgress every taboo, mix the sacred with the profane. And it was just, it was just satanic out of the pits of hell. He enters into this alliance with Adam Weisskopf, who was a Jesuit, and Meyer Rothschild, and they called themselves the Order of the Illuminati. Now, you can see there's a, list, a link on this slide to a list of Messiah claimants. Some people claim, who claim they were the Messiah also were claimed they were the Antichrist, which many people that claim they were the Messiah were, in fact, of an Antichrist spirit. But these three men are known as Hell's Council, and they formed the Order of the Illuminati. Why, meanwhile, this was formed... Uh, George Washington at the time, um, the, the Freemasons were founded in 1717, but George Washington before that in 1750, um, 1752, uh, after that, he became a Freemason in Virginia, and he was involved with Freemasons to the point of the worshipful master of his lodge. And so he was very prominent uh, in the Freemasons in 1752, um, but uh, the, the Illuminati was founded in 1776. So um, Washington, first it was the Freemasons founded, and then Washington became a Freemason, and then the Illuminati was founded May 1st, 1776, and the Declaration of Independence was signed July 4th, 1776. And Weisskopf was initiated into the Masonic Lodge. They came together and merged together in 1777, and Weisskopf asked uh, the members of the Illuminati to all infiltrate the Masonic lodges and to move into leadership positions so that they could spread the Illuminati propaganda. Now, what is the Illuminati propaganda? The Illuminati propaganda was written by Weisskopf, along with many, many evil, blasphemous books in the 1780s. I mean, nothing but the gates of hell. I mean, you're talking about the floodgates opening. Uh, you think it's sick what we're seeing now? Uh, there's, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Uh, and so um, the, the Illuminati's agenda was a hidden agenda, and they didn't want to advocate a satanic kingdom, kingdom but they wanted to gently steer people away from God by questioning the existence of God and promoting sexual liberation, independence for women, inclusiveness, diversity. What are we hearing? Internationalism, religious tolerance. Uh, and they wanted every agenda to come down except their own, their own agenda. This was Jacob Frank, Adam Weisskopf, and Mayor Rothschild. And remember, Weiss, uh, Weisskopf was a Jesuit. Um, 
So, meanwhile, we have a Jesuit priest named Lacunza, and he is calling Martin Luther uh, the Antichrist. Calling said his name represents 666, and he supported Rivera, and he said that, you know, the papacy was timeless, the Antichrist had to be a single, identifiable human being in the future. And he even wrote a book called The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty. Sounds like a good Christian book, but he was a Jesuit priest supporting all of these things that were from, from uh, Ribera. So all of this gets translated into English by this clergyman, uh, and uh, his name was Irving, Edward Irving. And so he took all of Lacunza's writings and put them into English. And um, he he's a, a church, and he founded his church called the Catholic Apostolic Church, and they had an emphasis on second on the second coming of Christ. Uh, meanwhile, this historian, English historian Maitland, he he was the first Protestant to accept Ribera's work as the Antichrist in the future, uh, and that the Pope is not the Antichrist, and Rome is not the fourth empire of Daniels too. And so he spread futurism to the Protestants. And then comes along John Darby, and that's one of our key players, a lawyer, and he built uh, most of his works off of this Jesuit priest, Lacunza, who built off of Ribera. And so Darby, you know, was, he's called the father of dispensationalism, the father of the Plymouth Brethren Church um, that would, would, would begin the spread of this eschatology against Christology. Irving even went on a hill to wait for the rapture and it didn't happen. Uh, but during this time, there were many false religions forming, many cults developing during the season of Darbyism. Uh, the Mormons were started, um, the Seventh-day Adventists were started, the National Spiritual, Spiritualist Association with Necromancy, um, the Christian sci Science Religion was started, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, Mormonism uh, was the first cult that started. Well, Orson Hyde was the Mormon. And in 1841, he went to Jerusalem, went on top of the Mount of Olives, and cited a Zionist prayer, dedicating the promised land back to the Jews. And Brigham Young University, a Mormon university, was built on the Mount of Olives in his honor. And you should be aware that the chosen TV, the chosen Bible studies are all from the Mormons and the Catholics. And that's what's training many of our people in our churches. Um, so then we have an interesting person who was very influential here in America, William Blackstone, an American evangelist and Zionist. And he is known as the father of modern Zionism, another Zionism. And his name, you know, was Blackstone and he was influenced by Moody and Darby. And uh, he went and got signatures from John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, Cyrus McCormick, and all, a lot of senators and congressmen and religious leaders and went to the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court and he formed this document called the Blackstone Memorial, which is a political position, petition that called upon our president at that time, uh, William Harrison, and asked him, asked him to, peti to petition the United States to be the ones to actively return the, the Jewish people to the Holy Land. So his focus was on restoring the Jews to the Holy Land as a prelude to his conversion to Christianity so, because he wanted to hasten the return of Jesus Christ. So he wrote this book, Jesus is Coming, because he was getting all of these political, financial, um, you know, influential leaders in the court system and the Congress and our president to uh, agree that, you know, it was the United States' job to actively get these the Jewish people returned so we could hasten the return of Jesus Christ. So along comes our next popular person, Schofield. Interesting, also a lawyer. Darby and Schofield, both lawyers. Um, an American theologian, a minister, and he wrote his Bible based on Darby's notes 
and futurism and dispensationalism, known as the Schofield Bible, that's been largely um, through his influence of his Bible that most fundamentalist Christians in the United States um, have been blinded by the dispensationalist uh, theolo theology. And we have popular religious leaders such as Hal Lindsey. But the biggest promoter of the Schofield Bible ever was Billy Graham. And that is uh, where that influence came from. We also have at this time Clarence Larkin, uh, who was the one that wrote Dispensational Truth and all those big charts you see in the screen in the Sunday school times and then churches that I had in my church, I had in my Bibles, big wall charts that showed all the things that was going to happen at the end times and all of this. He would draw all these charts with with the themes based on the Schofield Bible and what Blackstone, uh, you know, his his. The Blackstone Memorial to our president to get us to to, to return the Jews in Darby. Um, and then also the Rothschilds at this time were establishing the, the Jewish Colonization Association, buying up property and, and donating this acreage, the first 125 acreage for Jewish settlements. And they had very much, very much political and economic influence with the Kuznet built in their honor. They, um, uh, Lord Roth, or Edmund Rothschild's picture was on an Israeli coin, a banknote, and then this boulevard was named after him. And then we have George Steely down in Texas, uh, this American businessman, owner, uh, publisher of the Dallas Morning News. Um, and there's a plaza down there. The Dealey Plaza became famous because that was the site of the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963. And um, he's heavily involved in the occult 33rd degree Mason, uh, Shriner, uh, according to Reverend John Torrell. And the Dealey Plaza uh, is named after him uh, being the 33rd degree Mason because that's the site of the first Masonic temple in Dallas. And he used his political power, his newspaper, to promote the Schofield Bible and his teaching and to screen out anybody that would, um, you know, condemn him or contradict him. These are some pictures I took over in Israel uh, where the Rothschilds are honored throughout um, throughout Israel. They're honored. You'll see the Rothschild name on, on street signs. And, um, you know, the Kuznet was built uh, with their money, the Holocaust Museum with their money, the Caesarea by the Sea is owned by them, the hotels, the boulevard, the United Nations is influenced by them. Their foundations are in England and they're connected to the Oppenheimers and the 13 bloodlines, according to Fritz Springer. Um, and, you know, Lord Rothschild, he said, my family created Israel and they're the wealthiest family ever with connections to the Vatican Bank. They've bailed out the United States with J.P. Morgan, which is one of those signers that Blackstone got to go to the Ark to our U.S. president uh, to send the Jew to form the homeland in uh, Israel. Um, and every American bank is owned by the Rothschilds uh, Federal Reserve. They own the Federal Reserve. Uh, they helped pave the way for the creation of Israel, um, forcing the British government to sign the Balfour Declaration. Uh, and that they are, uh, you know, thought to have engineered the wars and very influential people. And Clarence Larkin wrote in his book that had all these charts, these 70 weeks, Daniel 70 week charts that he admitted in his own book that this was uh, from the papacy uh, being uh, accused of being the Antichrist and from the Jesuit um, accusation and that. Um, he said the papacy of the stigma of being called the Antichrist by the Jesuit Alcazar. So he admits that uh, his charts are based upon this whole uh, background. If you could go to this website, you can see uh, there's 88 charts online. There's a book of all of his charts. Um, this is the Daniel 70 week showing that the 70th week is stretched out into the seven year tribulation and into the future. Um, he has, so many of them that they're just really detailed, you know. Uh, but, you know, I used to carry these charts around and show people and um, scare people into becoming a Christian. Uh, but, you know, whatever means you get someone to the altar, you got to keep using that means to keep them there. You know, uh, if you keep you have to keep scaring them to keep them to keep them there because their heart's not really in it. They're doing it to, to, as a, a fire escape, an insurance. Um, why not use the goodness of God to keep them there? Why do we have to, why not use the word? Why not use Jesus Christ? Um, 
why not use the Holy Spirit uh, instead of all of these scare tactics that we don't even know? Nobody knows the whole truth uh, of how everything's going to happen. See, these things move the soul, the emotions. It triggers your emotions, but it does not really change your will or your actions. That's why you had those crypto Jews in the very beginning, because they were forced to do something. You know, they they were something on the outside, but they're not really that on the inside. And that's what we're seeing in our churches is we have so many things on the outside, but not on the inside. But repentance and faith has to come from the Holy Spirit. No man comes to the Father except the Holy Spirit draws him. And so the next person we have is the Dora Herzl, and he's the Jewish journalist, another lawyer. Uh, he is touted as the spiritual father of the Jewish state and the father of political Zionism. And he's the one that chose the Star of David as a symbol for the country, and he formed the first Zionist Congress. So being called the spiritual father of the Jewish state, and he's mentioned the Israeli Declaration of Independence, but yet he has no stance uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, so which spirit is it? Uh, and then we have Louis Schaefer, American theologian. He's the one that aided Schofield in establishing the Philadelphia School of the Bible. So now you're going to see this getting transferred from all of this political arena and this political agenda down into um, the, the Bible schools. They founded the Dallas Theological Seminary, which is the center of modern dispensational teaching. And Schaefer published um, a whole book uh, system a whole book series on the systematic theolo theology, and it is a required textbook for students in the Dallas Theological Seminary. And graduates from the seminary are Chuck Wendall, which became president of Dallas Theological Seminary, Hal Lindsey, David Jeremiah, Christy Tebow, Tim Tebow's wife, Andy Stanley, uh, on and on and on. Um, and then we have David Ben-Gurion, who was Israel's founding father and the prime minister of Israel. And he's a pantheist. A pantheist means everything is God. And I remember going to uh, the temple of Pan in Israel, and that's where Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's where they did um, human sacrifices of babies uh, at the temple of Pan. And so he was, he was, he's the one that named the state of Israel, but it took him weeks and weeks and maybe eight months, I'm not sure how long, for them to name the state of Israel. Because, see, it never was Israel. It was Palestine. Um, Israel that was in two separate kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judea. Jesus was out of Judea. Jerusalem is in Judea. And so Judea was one of the names that they were going to give it. Um, and, and Zion was another name. And then they had some other Jewish names, which I'm not familiar with there. You see them listed. But they, they were going to even name it Palestine, but they rejected Palestine because they said they had the intention of making a second Palestinian state. Um, and so um, he he's the one that drafted and signed the Declaration of Independence. And you have Harry Truman here, U.S. President Harry Truman, recognizing this um, this new nation with David Ben-Gurion. And like I said, Herzl is the one that um, chose the Star of David, which David never did have a star, um, to represent the state of Israel. It never was a Jewish symbol, like the menorah, the line of Judah, the shofar. This is a hexagram. It's a, like a pentagram. It's used in the occult and ceremon ceremonial magic. And it is a six-pointed star that has been commonly used as a talisman uh, to conjure up spirits and spiritual forces in diverse forms of occult magic. Uh, it is uh, a it was used for mystical purposes with the seal of Solomon. You know, Solomon's turn and his wives started worshiping other gods, and they started sacrificing children. Uh, this became a symbol for Solomon. It's a symbol of the Muslims and the Kabbalist Jews. David Ben-Gurion uh, said back in 62, you know, that, that Jerusalem was going to be um, a place that, you know, would house a new world order, basically, uh, with the United Nations. It's right there in line with the, with the Mount of Olives. You can see the United Nations. It's directly there, directly above, actually, where Judas hung himself and where Solomon sacrificed the children in the Kendron Valley. 
Uh, but Ben Gurion was saying that there would be an international police force and all armies will be uh, banished and there will be no more wars uh, in accordance with Isaiah 2, which is what you see on the United Nations building building in New York City or on any United Nations building. Uh, in 1948, when they put this up here, that um, due to the New World Order, there would be no more war, no more war and the United Nations will build a shrine of the prophets to serve the Federated Union of all continents. And this will be the seat of the Supreme Court of Mankind to settle all controversies among the Federated Continents as prophesied by Isaiah. So really they're talking about the Sanhedrin here coming into play and ruling the world and through the Noahide laws. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, another uh, graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary is Hal Lindsey. He wrote his books in 70 and 80, and none of his predictions have, have ever come to pass. You know, he's still alive today. Um, he said the most important sign of all is that the Jews return to the land of Israel. Uh, the Jew is the most important sign to this generation. The rebirth of Israel is the sign. Um, and uh, in order for um, uh, the, the second coming. In order for the return of Jesus Christ is what it says. And then we have Tim LaHaye who wrote fiction. It's a, a apocryphatic fiction left behind series. And he had a, um, uh, a union with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He founded the Council for National Policy with them, who was backed by the Freemasons. Um, he launched this council during the Reagan administration, which Reagan was the first president to adopt the Noahide laws. Um, and also he had a, um, a connection with Sun Moon. Uh, he accepted money from him and he joined Moon's Council for Religious Freedom. And Sun Moon um, claimed to be the Messiah. And he was also said to have a close relationship with Netanyahu. So connect the dots, connect the dots. Uh, there is a true agenda here. So the Noahide laws were initiated by Carter in 78 and by, signed into law by Reagan in 82, saying that this, these are the foundation of America's character. These are the laws that I believe that they will try to uh, um, you know, rule all nations through the United Nations, which will be the Sanhedrin Court. Um, it's um, called the Education Day USA Bill, uh, and there's the bill. Um, number and name if you want to look it up and I believe that's connected to this thing that we're seeing in the universities that's going on right now uh, the university protests the connection there possibly some setup uh, Bill da uh, Dannemeyer a U.S. congressman uh, has a website up that you know that he put up in the 70s when the this was being signed that now the government can legally kill Christians. Uh, it is now legal to kill Christians at that time for the crime of worshiping Jesus Christ. And of course, you have Trump calling to bring back the death penalty. This has been on the books, but it's not been enforced as of yet. Uh, Trump is the champion of these laws, um, and uh, he, of course, moved the embassy to Jerusalem, which many thought was you know a great thing. But basically, that embassy being in Jerusalem means if anyone hits Israel, they've now hit uh, the United States. And um, his pictures on the on the temple, third temple coin, uh, he connects himself with Cyrus, uh, King Cyrus, the 45th uh, president. Uh, the 40, he's the 45th president connected to the, the Cyrus, who was also the 45th ruler. And that you know his he believes his mission. He is a he is a converted Jew. Uh, is to, uh, to to build that temple and to uh, continue with this agenda. Uh, he further supported the Abraham Accords, uh, which is bringing all three quote-unquote Abrahamic religions, which they're really not Abraham's religions, uh, into a one-world uh, peace unit, uh, treaty. And so John Hague is one of the biggest, uh, most influential um, people in America now that Billy Graham's gone, um, that's con that's promoting um, this agenda. He has actually more evangelicals in uh, behind him than there are Jews, um, and you know that Palestine, a Jewish ethno state in Palestine, is a requirement for the fulfillment of the end times prophecy and necessary for Jesus Christ to return to Earth. That's what he stands for. 
And uh, so anyone that supports this, that's what you uh, maybe don't know this organization. That's the belief system that this is all necessary and that by human human effort, we're going to humanly make this happen so that Jesus can come back. And then we have our quote unquote Christian Zion, a speaker of the house. Um, Mr. Johnson, who is promoting, of course, these anti-Semitic bills against things uh, that people is not even Semitic. So um, that's not even been defined. Uh, so, um, you know, Palestine, Palestinian people are Semites, possi possibly. So setting up the enforcement for the Noahide law is this anti-Semitic bill, which has already been out there. This is a website I grabbed in 2016. Um, you know, talks that it was illegal then to say that there's, uh, you can't quote the scriptures about having anything to do with Jesus and the Jews killing uh, or handing Jesus over to uh, the blood of Jesus and being on their shoulders. Now back to that uh, encyclopedia, the Jewish encyclopedia that I have. This is what the encyclopedia says. The Jewish encyclopedia says that the Jews were better prepared for a national movement than any other ethnic group. And a transformation was needed for this modern nationalization and that all people would have to undergo an attitude change in order to get involved with this national movement. And that uh, with the appearance, there would be this modern idea, which was later called Zionism. So Zionism heavily relied on the emotional appeal of the of the Christians to get them behind that, uh, to have a human action. The heir of the Messiah had arrived. Redemption would have to be achieved by human action. Jews and non-Jews would have to be convinced of the truth of this mission. Now, believe it or not, most of the Jews from Eastern Europe were opposed to this. This is just a, an elite group that's that's backing this. And, and that's why you see Jews marching over there now against Netanyahu, because most of the Jews aren't for it. Uh, it's it's the it's the elite Orthodox group that's a, that's promoting it, and so they were opposed though on the grounds that the coming Messiah should not be urged by human endeavor. This is back in '72, but they said propaganda would be needed among preachers and entertainers, and an appeal to Rothschilds for a miraculous redemption of Jesus of Jerusalem or the temple area. So Christian Zionists are caught up in this political drama, and they don't really realize that they're supporting, uh, you know, the new law supports that we can't speak the Bible, um, that we can't uh, say certain texts out of the Bible. Um, and we, what we need to remember is Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Even though John Hagee says that the man or nation that lifts a voice or hand against Israel invites the wrath of God. Well, who's Israel? Who's Israel? Uh, that's John Hagee claiming that. So Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Jesus inherits the blessings. It's Jesus. It's not uh, a piece of land. It's not a state. Because it says here in Genesis uh, 12:3 that Abraham's blessing is for all families of the earth. Okay? So it Jesus came, and Jesus is the heir to the throne He's the heir to the land. It's his It's his right to rule that. And thankfully, we do have some um, representatives who are standing up against it, you know, from Florida and Georgia, a couple here. The Bible is clear. There's no myth or controversy about this that, you know, uh, they say that, uh, that they're not anti-Semitic. We're not anti-Semitic. We're not against any nation. Uh, they're not better than we are. We're not better than they are. Uh, but that to, to say that the to anti-Semitism they're saying is believing the gospel. It says Jesus was handed over to Herod to be crucified by the Jews. Uh, that's how the Bible. So they're going to start taking the Bible away. You know, they're following right down those Noahide laws to not being able to worship Jesus Christ, which is already on the books. So uh, I'm not going to read all these out, but as these things were happening, you know, with Freemasonry starting in 1717, Illuminati, Illuminati in 1776, um, and then America the same year, and the Jesuits merging uh, the with the Freemasons, and how that got into uh, America, the Schofield Bible, how that got in, you know, came out the same year as the Balfour declaration and then how just i'm not going to go through each one of these but you can see how roe v wade came into woodstock 
gay rights, uh, transgender movement, the emergent church, homosexuals in the military, uh, how the internet played into it, the embassy um, uh, being moved to Jerusalem, how that set at the chosen TV series. All these things start how they're so connected, dot to dot. And the word says that the only thing that can make the word of God of no effect is the traditions that you've handed down. So these things have been handed down from one man to another man to another man. Okay, we're following the things of man rather than the things of God. And so um, John Darby, you know, organized that Plymouth Brethren Church, and and he's the he propagated that the the Israel and the church are two separate programs and two separate comings of Christ, and that the church and Israel are distinct, and the church has to be removed before the remnant of Israel can be gathered. And so um, he traveled to North America, and he preached this in the evangelical and fundamentalist pastors in America, uh, and his view became the basis of uh, this widely circulated Schofield reference Bibles. And it's accepted today. It's uh, It was controversial at that time because it didn't have any historical roots. Um, but tens of millions of American evangelists, evangelicals have joined the Zionist camp, and they believe the commentary rather than the word. Schofield started hap uh, helping Dwight Moody in his revival campaign in Dallas. And, um, and, and that's... That's how uh, he got in with Dwight Moody and then connected with the Bible conferences and the um, colleges. And so in 1909, his reference Bible solidified the dispensationalism in the United States. And it was common among non-denominational non churches, Baptist, Pentecostal, Charismatic. And he had a DD after his name for doctorate, but he never produced any doctorate degree from any seminary or university. Uh, he founded Bible schools, the Philadelphia School of the Bible. Uh, he headed up the Southwestern School of the Bible in Dallas. He was on the board of trustees of colleges, uh, Bible colleges. So the, his Bible was the Bible that was used in all these uh, schools and colleges. And his 1909 version is the first version to come out about the temple being rebuilt and the animal sacrifices offered. And, you know, this is uh, a doctrine of demons because it's tampering with the blood of Jesus. It crosses the line whenever we start taking and, and saying that, you know, that something else can take away our sins and that we have to get the church out of the way so that this can happen, so that the red heifer sacrifice can happen. That's an insult to our Savior. That transcends sacrifice. You know, his Bible, this next 1917 Bible, which became the most famous Bible, most promoted Bible, came out the same year as the Balfour. Declaration. The Balfour Declaration, remember, was a public statement by the British government announcing its support for the establishment of a national home in the, of the Jewish people in Palestine. It was written to Lord Rothschild. And so it was also printed by the Oxford University Press. Um, and that's where Lord Roth, Rothschild was a graduate of. Um, so Schofield and Balfour, you know, they were they had a connection. They The Bible was printed that year, his most famous Bible was selling millions of copies, uh, was coming out saying that, hey, you know, there's going to be um, uh, the, the Jews are going to be returned to their, their holy land. And here you have Lord Rothschild, graduate of Oxford, uh, where the Bible's being printed, um, you know, signing getting this letter from the British government. So why wouldn't you think that, oh, wow, look, the prophecy's coming to ha pass. It's right here in the Bible. Now it's happening right here in the world. It's a simultaneous mass marketing uh, that, that would appear that God himself had co-signed the declaration and that, you know, this prophecy was being fulfilled right before everyone's eyes. Uh, but who was supporting this Bible? Who funded his Bible? Samuel Unt Untermeyer. And uh, he was a 33rd degree Mason. Uh, I'm, I don't know, 33rd degree, but he was uh, uh, connected to the Masons. They believe he was a, a Mason uh, because he was a speaker. There's proof out there. I found the proof that he was a speaker in many of the Masonic lodges calling upon Masons to support the boycott of German goods. So he had a lot of power and authority. He was another lawyer in Kansas. And that's, um, uh, he, he promoted um, the Schofield's Bible wherever he went. And he founded, he was one of the founders of the Federal Reserve, connected to the Rothschilds. 
he we do know that he was in a secret society for hermetism which is magic as a, as above so below and the phallus was their main symbol and that you know this is connected to um uh this this term uh, as above so below is a magical term which is now in the message bible and the lord's prayer and so Schofield's Bible passed to these churches from the Bible schools. Here's all the editors of the Schofield Reference Bible of all the different Bible schools that were uh, part of uh, where the editors were located uh, for this Bible. So his Bible supported world Zionism. It radically changed the context of the King James Version. Um, remember, King James was out there, and, and he was being threatened to be killed. And so um, the modern state of Israel, a state that did not even exist yet, when this Bible came out in 1917, didn't even exist yet, was already on the drawing boards, was already committed to and funded by world Zionism. But little, some eyebrow raisers on Schofield. At 29, he was in Kansas. There where that guy was that promoted his uh, uh, his his Bible. And uh, he was the US, youngest U.S. district attorney. But he was forced to resign that same year under a cloud of scandal of accepting bribes and stealing political contributions and forging signatures. Described as a shyster, jailed on charges of check forgery, abandoned his wife, a heavy drinker. His wife was a Catholic woman, and, she, and uh, she filed for divorce because he deserted her and her children. He was making all this money, you know. Later, made he later made all this money and still didn't support her. He was accused of infidelity. Well, then he gets converted at a Dwight L. Moody uh, evangelistic campaign. He becomes a Christian, uh, and he was ordained as a con congregational minister while his divorce was proceeding. So here he was, a born-again preacher with his Bible, and then, and then this Uttenmeyer, which is very controversial, speaking at the Masonic Lodges and in the private uh, secret societies uh, with hermet hermetics, is, um, is also getting him into this club called the Lotus Club that had atheists and communists. And uh, Mark Twain uh, was a member, which is uh, very controversial because he's promoted all over Israel now. He was a Freemason. Uh, so all these controversial people were in this Lotus Club, and he also was accused of plagiarizing Darby's work, and many people speculated that he was recruited by the Rothschilds to infiltrate the Protestant Christianity with by creating their own Bible, funded by this powerful Zionist Samuel Uttenmeyer. So here is, uh, you know, what Darby planted. Schofield watered and what Schofield planted the church watered because Billy Graham is the biggest promoter of the Bible. Um, and, you know, he's the one to formalize the sinner's prayer that that's never been in the Bible. Um, they didn't have they didn't have to believe, repent, confess Jesus and be immersed in the water for the forgiveness of their sins. Uh, that was, you know, there's a whole process other than just saying a, a sinner's prayer. And so um, there's many articles out there. You can find them where where Billy Graham's crusades were often funded by the Freemason William Hearst, Patty Hearst, um, that uh, mansion out in, in um, Beverly Hills. Um, and here is a picture of Billy Graham with the Pope. And on front of the Pope's um, robe is the Jesuit logo. Uh, this is William Rand Randolph Hearst, who was the promoter and supporter of Billy Graham's crusades. Um, it said he had unusual promotion um, and, and, and in this article here and that, you know, he was the publisher and the owner of the New York Times, the owner of the San Francisco Examiner, uh, was big in Hollywood with his Beverly Hills mansion. He also promoted books at the same time on Satanism. So um, very controversial. Um, and we'll look at some of Schofield's footnotes now. For Genesis 12, 3, uh, number one, you know, he's talking about bless them, the bless thee, talking about Abraham. Um, the word he's saying in his commentary that this curse was laid upon those who persecuted the Jews. Well, the Jews at the time of Abraham, that wasn't even a word. The word Jew didn't come about until 1500s. It was due to heights and it's specific to the tribe of Judah. And the word Jew came from a man's interpretation, whereas the word Israel came from God. So there were 4,000 years from the time this verse was written to the time of Jesus. Why didn't Jesus bless the Jews based on their ethnicity? He said, oh, generation of vipers, synagogue of Satan. He wasn't going around blessing um, 
the anybody there on the Holy Land just because it was the Holy Land. Big question for me. Yeah, uh, big eye opener there. His 1967 version um, in Schofield uh, was talking about um, the state of Israel. Uh, well, the state of Israel, how did that come into this verse? He was talking about anti-Semitism. Uh, why would that even be a word in, in, related to these verses in Abraham's time? Those weren't words. Uh, so, uh, you know, Jacob uh, was Israel. and He was a man with descendants. He wasn't a state. Um, and so the secular nation of Israel didn't even... Um, Exist time at that time. So the love of Jesus has been replaced with the love of Israel. That's what you see everywhere. Uh, so Schofield died in 1921, but this is the 1967 Bible, and you can see that the notes keep growing. Who's updating this? The 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 propaganda keeps growing. So uh, you might have a 1967 Bible, but it's different than the 1921 or the 1909 Bible and the 1917 Bible, these are all different. So I looked up Oxford Press today, just recently this week, and this, these are the study Bibles that they're they're po uh, propagating today. The Schofield Study Bible, the Book of Mormons, the Catholic Bible, the Jewish Study Bible, the New Oxford Annotated Bible, but I didn't really see anything from King James. So I have this uh, uh, Moody Institute uh, Moody Bible Institute uh, Schofield Bible course. I actually have these books in my possession from 1907. This is a Bible course before his Bible came out, what Schofield was promoting. And he was talking then about the papacy of the Antichrist and, and that it's not the Pope. It's not a sy system. Uh, it, it's a person, but it's not a system and that it's not, um, it's not the papacy. So he also is promoting in 1907 that Satan persecutes Israel and um, the remnant of Israel and that Jesus is coming in the air for his saints. And then he has another coming with his saints. Well, nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus is coming for his saints. It says in his saints and with his saints. So again, reading the commentaries, we need to read the word and have the Lord uh, reveal to us exactly what it is that the Holy Spirit wants us to uh, be taught. And so also here he's separating the church uh, from Israel. He's asking the students to write about the last days related to Israel and the last days related to the church and um, uh, the synonymous with the millennial range or the kingdom age. He said Israel and the Gentiles only are dwelling on the earth in the day of the Lord as the rapture of the church precedes it. So he's, again, telling them in this Bible course how things are going to be laid out without any biblical scriptures proving it. And of course, we have all these other books that's come out, The Jupiter Effect, Beyond the Jupiter Effect, um, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1888, What Didn't Happen. So the same guy wrote a book, you know, The Final Shout, Now It's Going to Happen in 1989, Well, It Didn't Happen in 1989. And he, he came up with this by saying Israel was formed in 1948. So plus 40 is a generation, so that means the rapture is 1988. Well, my uncle wrote a book on one reason why the rapture didn't happen in 1988. So, um, and we have Dr. Jeremiah uh, recently putting out 31 ways to be rapture ready. Everybody's focused on rapture ready. Remember, he's a, a graduate of the Dallas Theological Seminary. So here's some more um, uh, advertisements. You know, I've grabbed just this week, just this week. It's supposed to happen here in 2024. You know, this is a big um, moneymaker, big moneymaker. Um, the rapture was supposed to happen in uh, last, this past, yesterday, past May 18th. The eclipse date plus 40 days. You could find that. It was all over YouTube. Um, and I have uh, a Dakes annotated Bible that was given to me back in the 80s. I had a person um, in my church say, oh, no, you got to get rid of your Bibles. This is the Bible you need. This is the Bible that you need to study. Well, I still have that Bible. I took a picture of it. I had an old calendar in there. And I started reading through the commentaries a couple weeks ago. And, you know, it's just so many things that's not right. You know, saying that Jesus Christ was never anointed until 30 years after he was born. He didn't have any anointed. Uh, he wasn't anointed till then. And it's, t it's talking about the temple being built in the future. Um, and, you know, the refuge is 
this verse ref refutes that he was not anointed. For unto you is born to stay in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He is anointed. That's what Christ means. Um, and, then he, and then he has in the commentaries in the back that the, there'll always be segregation, that the Jews was recognized as a separate people in all ages because of God's choice, and segregation between the Jews and all other nations will remain in all eternity. And all nations will remain segregated from one another in their own parts of the earth forever. I mean, it, it's just crazy stuff, which you start reading in these uh, commentaries. Uh, and this is from Dake, and he had a shady past, come to find out. Uh, he he um, was accused of transporting a 16-year-old across the Wisconsin state line in 1937 for debauchery and other immoral purposes, practices. And um, he, he had this... Um, he was registered at hotels with this young girl in St. Louis under a, a different name, used a different name. He, well, he got up to 10 years imprisonment and a fine of $10,000, and he pleaded guilty. But he was ordained through the Assemblies of God and later the Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee. And so, you know, here his, here's his Bible. And I'm going to tell you, this Bible was in the Assemblies of God, Church of God. That's where I got it from. Um, but when you look at the... Um, um, online here at the Bibles at Romans 8, 1, all these other um, Bibles, and, and I've under, my understanding is, is all these other translations have at least Mormon or Catholic on the board when they're rewritten. They took out the whole words, walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. They took that out. They, all they're saying is there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, period. So they're saying you don't have to walk after the spirit. See, they don't want you to walk after the spirit. They want you to walk after the flesh. They want you to walk after the physical, the physical building, the physical sacrifice, the physical uh, whatever they're promoting, you know, uh, the, the, you know, that's in your fantasy of being removed, the physical antichrist that, you know, there's not, a, there is an antichrist spirit. That's, that's obvious throughout the whole Bible. The word is living. The word is living, um, you know, uh, there, there's uh, been antichrist spirits in the past. Nero, the Pope, or whoever, the president, Pope Francis, King Charles, the, the future, Bill Gates, whoever. The word, it, there's an antichrist spirit. The word is a living word. It's for today. What I read for today is a confirmation for me today. It's a way for me to walk. It's a living word today. Um, and we can see the Jesuits are still in control at the forefront, controlling climate change, getting us ready for the appearance of Jesus Christ, the apparitions, the spiritual phenomena. You know, being homosexual is not a crime. Uh, this apocalypse prediction causing people to stay in fear. You know, this is part of uh, this this uh, spirit that's behind this. The purpose for our existence has been distorted. The Jews, the Christians, the Catholics have all been blinded and used for a power of the gods of this world. Um, you know, we say, well, if Jack Van Impey or somebody like him can quote all those scriptures, surely he must know what he's talking about. But how many people actually sit and study the book of Daniel or Revelation for themselves? These things have been handed down by men who are not spirit-filled, and, and most people are not reading the Bible for themselves. The Holy Ghost wrote the Bible. It's inspired. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's spiritually discerned. Spiritual things are absolute foolishness to the natural man. Um, they can't know them because they're spiritually learned. So are the people that's teaching me filled with the Spirit? But most people just let their pastors do their praying and the studying for them, and they never study. They don't know what they believe and why they believe it. They can't give a reason for the hope that lies within them. They don't know history or scripture. And I'll be honest, I didn't know all this history until I started digging into it. But I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to share it with you, to let you decide. You pray about it. You know, God has magnified his word above his name. He works in the confines of what he himself has declared. He said, I seek for a man, which is the church. The church is his incarnation. We're supposed to be him. In a, uh, his, he's the light. We're supposed to be light and salt, remove the corruption in a dark world. The Antichrist denies that he is come in the flesh, not was come or will come. He is. He's here. Uh, he was there when Jesus was there. If you don't read, you don't know. The people just want entertainment. They love Schofield because it's the easy way out. You read the commentary, you don't have to study for yourself. And Satan's scheme is to 
uh, evacuate man from the planet. But he's, the Lord tells us to occupy until he comes. Uh, but we've been paralyzed. Our vision has been distorted. It's not any minute, any minute. It's until he comes. We keep working, producing fruit until he comes. How much have you gained by what you've been given? How have you invested your time, your talent, your treasure? When he says, what have you done for me? Are we going to say, oh, I've just sat here waiting for you to come? I just wanted you to come. Or are we going to see what we produced? Uh, do we know the roots of what we believed? Many don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know that Jesus is the seed of Abraham and he owned all the land and he rules from the throne and he has the right to rule all the land from the throne. As he is, so are we. But many people think to hell with the world. I just want my mansion. I'll just say the sinner's prayer and I'll soon be raptured out of here. I don't need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't have to be discipled or grow up or change. I can reign without suffering. See, we water and plant the seed, the word, and that's Jesus. And the Holy Spirit changes people. Please question me. Examine everything you believe. Search the scriptures to find out. Get in a secret place. Uh, go back to our only source, which is the word of God. We must believe, must not believe uh, somebody just because we admire them. We respect them. They are influential. They have money and status. The word of God is the plumb line. And we have to be Bereans and be led by the spirit. You know, what will the end look like? He says, uh, the, 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 the disciples are asking Jesus, um, he said, and this, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. He said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The end will look like him. Well, where do we see him? We have to see him in the church. The end is a person. We are the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We must present him to the world, a light in a dark world. Uh, we have to present salt which gets rid of the corruption in this world and to have a single eye, a single eye, you know, the lamp is the body of the eye, one eye um, that is full of light, that both of our eyes are focused and we're not divided. We're not focusing on this to the right, this to the left. Listen to this voice, that voice. We can't be double-minded. We have to be totally focused on the doctrine of Christ because he is the end. That is him. Um, no one has all the answers, but we must be teachable and open to change and repent because God doesn't fit on our charts. He doesn't fit on our box and, and we don't have a hand on him. We don't know one day to the next, his plan, uh, he can lead us into all different types of paths, you know, and so, um, we have to be instant in season and out of season, ready to give an answer that our hope is in him and God I am content with whatever situation I'm in, uh, whatever's going on in my life. I have to trust you and be unsettled, unshakable, immovable. And so uh, being double-minded is, is instability, and that's what we're seeing. So um, uh, if you do have any comments or questions, you can email me. My website is www.faithbasedmentalhealth.com if you would like to receive the notes from this or this uh, PowerPoint uh, link. Um, you can get that there. I do appreciate your listening. Uh, the next session will be June the 14th, and I will talk about that 70th week of Daniel, and it's all about Jesus. Uh, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That is referring to Jesus, not the Antichrist. Thank you, and God bless you. Father, I submit this word unto your um, authority, Lord, that you, you will use it and it will be used to plant seeds and water seeds and that your Holy Spirit will draw all to the truth. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.